Good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning. And it's like it's like getting the place ready for the Christ. You know, that's that's the way that you work on these things. You just feel like you're in service to the Christ and and all of you coming, that's like the Christ coming. And so it's yeah, it's like in India, I was just in India, I think they call it Siva. It's like service. You know, just a life of service and devotion and having your whole life be like a prayer. Let it all merge together to just be a unified prayer. And then it's like your mind can just naturally then just ascend, you know, up like that. I think Joe Cocker just died, but love lift us up where we belong. <laughs> Famous song from Joe. And it's gyrating around, so in the spirit, and so in the love. And that's really what we're all about. We've talked a bit about the idea of experience. Um, it's interesting that in heaven there are no beliefs. So this whole realm is a realm of beliefs. And it's interesting that in a realm of such diversity of beliefs that there's all this right and wrong about who, who believes correctly. And none of them are correct, actually. There, there aren't any beliefs in heaven. God didn't create beliefs, so it's, it, it makes you stop the next time you, you, you're talking to somebody about beliefs. So I, I like hearing people's beliefs, because I know that they don't have anything to do with anything. So I listen very attentively, and they can tell me anything. You know, I'm, I'm nodding and smiling. It could, they could say, God lives in a pink pyramid in such and such a place, and I'd just be nodding and, hmm, tell me more, you know, because because I'm more just liking their presence of who they are and the opportunity to just be in that presence together. So there's no splitting hairs over beliefs. And then Jesus teaches us in the Course that forgiveness is the only helpful belief. It's like a blanket of peace that just extends over the whole universe. Because forgiveness doesn't oppose. And that's what I like. I like just being the presence of forgiveness, so I can be, I'm so agreeable, people, I mean, I, I won't necessarily agree verbally, but I'm, they can see it in my eyes, and when my head is nodding, my head is almost nodding like, tell me more, this, you know, and it's just feeling the presence, that's the most adorable thing to me. We have a friend in Canada who, who tell me, someone was telling me recently that he played that song, I want to look twice at you until I see the, the Christ in you. Jeff, he played it for hours. <laughs> he just played, he put it on as a meditation and it just went on and on for hours and hours. I guess Andy was saying, how many hours? Oh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> no, everyone lost many, track. Many, many hours. <laughs> they, lost, they lost track of time. Yeah, when I'm looking through the eyes of love, that's the song too. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Yeah. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. <laughs> I know, isn't it great? All those <laughs> songs and hymns, now they're a little lit up, you know. I remember when I was in church, when I was a child, I don't know that I was as lit up, but now I am. <laughs> now I, I get those old hymns running through my mind. Rejoice, rejoice, you know. It's, and it's fun. Christmas is fun now. Christmas isn't like a, a heavy time of pressure and anxiety. It's, it's just a, a time of, of happy celebration, you know, when it comes around. You can just chime right in with it. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. And part of the fun of traveling for me is that, uh, yeah, there's so many different pathways to God. I, I just enjoy being shown. I can see it in people's eyes when they're very devoted and, and joyful and happy, and then they, they want to tell of their discoveries, you know, and wow, it's fun to listen to people share their miracles. Different cultures, different ways, different pathways, different theologies. But there's no sense of, uh, there's no one to convince of anything. It's, it's, that's where the contentment is. You can be absolutely just content in your state of presence, without having to even speak of it. If there are words, great. If there are no words, then 
it's great if you're just dancing. I, when I went to India this time, uh, the woman who hosted me in New Delhi, she said, before I got there, David, you know, the reason I like you, the reason I watch you on YouTube is, you have no gimmicks. You have no gimmicks. In India, we have many gimmicks. <laughs> uh, every teacher has a gimmick, but I watch you on YouTube because you have no gimmicks. And so, when I finally went there and she invited like 40 of her friends to come see me at like a satsang in New Delhi, she said, well, first I'll be two elderly people will come up and, and introduce you and give you some flowers or something, and then we will have a whirling dervish. <laughs> I'm going, okay, I've never had a whirling dervish before at any of my gatherings, and I said, that sounds good though, I'd like to have a whirling dervish. And so she said, it's a gimmick. <laughs> when you're in India, we use gimmicks. So it's a gimmick. It's for my friends. It's a gimmick. So, but, you know, it's just fun because it's like that old thing, live and let live. You, when you live and let live, you really live your life through joy and happiness and inspiration. And you let everyone do the same, regardless of what it is. There's no point in <coughs> trying to judge anybody for anything. What's the point of it? It just takes away, it blocks your own happiness when you try to judge somebody else. And people talk about, well, there's certain behaviors, we can't be condoning certain behaviors. You know, we, from that movie last night, we could really see that, that it's these interpretations aren't coming from the world to us, that, that consciousness is generating these false interpretations. So we have to take responsibility for our state of mind. We have to take everyone else off the hook if we're going to be off the hook. Because as long as we hold on to interpretations of, of persons, places, events, um, then we, that's what Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. That you'll bring on to yourself whatever you hold on to in your consciousness. And he wanted us to be free. So to me that's very, very important that that we do that. And then the Gospel of Thomas came out, you know, when they found the Gospels of, according to Thomas, but I think Judge Not was Jesus' shortest teaching, and then in, in the Gospel of Thomas, be passers-by. Mm -hmm. We have to be passers-by of the world. Like, let the world go by. Mm -hmm. Don't... He, he talks about that in, in Lesson 128. The only value that this world holds for you is that you pass it by without looking back on it. Be above the battleground. Just watch it. Just watch it. Forgiveness is quiet, serene. It quietly does nothing. It looks and waits and watches and judges not. You know, it's, it's, it's just a profound state of mind. And so, in one sense, everyone talks about being proactive versus passive, but this state of forgiveness is, is a state where you can watch Watch the thoughts, and you don't give any power to the thoughts, and then eventually the, the thoughts aren't there. The, the thoughts can't even enter your mind, your pristine holy mind. The light it becomes so strong and so bright that you, the thoughts of temptation, the thoughts of ego, they can't even enter. And, you know, the Bible said, perfect love cast out fear, so that's, that's another way of saying the same thing. If we devote our lives to loving, and then the fear doesn't have a space, you know. If we keep our garden weeded, uh, and clear and clean, then we have, we have space for the fruits, and there are plenty, plenty of fruits. Also, it's transparency. I, I feel like the way we live our life is, has to be a extremely transparent, because if we're truly living a life where we say, my mind holds only what I think with God, we've got nothing to hide or protect. You can afford to be a really open book when you live a devoted life. You know, you can say to people, that's right, come, come closer, look as close as you want. Um, there was a, a Christian, I think, one time, who was following Gandhi around and was asking him about his beliefs, his Hindu beliefs, and so on and so forth, and Gandhi just smiled and just said, well, why don't you just 
follow me around and live with me. You know, he wasn't going to give him some kind of dissertation. His way of life, he was so comfortable and confident and relaxed in his way of living that he could say with an open invitation, just come with me, follow me around in a friendly way. Come along with me. Just, let's walk together. Let's live together for a while and, and see. That's what Jesus did. Very friendly. He said, come, come, all you who are weary and laden and burdened, and I shall give you rest. And we want our lives to be such a, a life of devotion, to be so integrous that we can, in a friendly way, say, say come along, come and see, come in closer. Instead of this kind of pushing people away and get away from me, I need my space, uh, or sometimes I'll see these metaphysical or spiritual books um, where uh, they'll have some pretty profound, kind of radical things to say, but, but sometimes it's almost like it's uh, one of these ghost writers, because the person who, whose name is on the book, they're nowhere to be found. You can't call them, you can't write them, you can't email them, you can't see them. And it's nice, I, I like books because you can share some nice ideas, but isn't this about the living practice of it? Aren't we here to be witnesses of love? Witnesses of Christ's love? Shouldn't there be a little bit of availability with that? You know, why would we be reclusive? I mean, there are, of course there's times when we want to just pray and rest, and I have those times too when I'm traveling for five months where I just want to Watch the grass grow, you know, I can just sit out on my lawn chair and enjoy the grass. But, uh, but I think overall, that's part of the Spirit's use of the body as a witness. We are to have smiling faces, our foreheads are to be serene and calm. We are to be an example for those who can turn and say, Wow, you look happy today, what's going on with you? And that we invite we have an invitation, an ongoing invitation, by our state of mind. The Bible said, let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, and, and I have found with our guidelines, we talked about last night, no people pleasing, no private thoughts, mm -hmm. that when you actually start putting those into practice, that's just an invitation to expose the unconscious, and the ego will come up. Um, when you have the allowance, when you have the permission and the allowance of no private thoughts and no people pleasing, what that is really saying is, we don't want you to stuff it down. And I think underneath a lot of the, the pride and the arrogance and the self-centeredness you're talking about, uh, there's a lot of repression and denial. They're not in touch with their heart. They really need to get in touch with their heart. And I know from my own life experiences with the parable of David, going back, I was very shy, I was the, voted the most shy, quiet person in my senior class, in the yearbook, and so on and so forth. I think in my 20s, I started to realize that I had a lot of major repression and denial going on. I mean, I, I became very aware. Later on, when I'd be in my 30s, uh, and would travel to South America, and I would do my enlightenment gatherings, and my enlightenment gatherings weren't women's retreats or men's retreats. Enlightenment gatherings are everybody's invited, we're all awakening. It's all about enlightenment and devotion to God. But about, like in Colombia, 93% of the people that would show up at my gatherings in Colombia were women. And about 95, 96, 97% of the people in Argentina that would show up at my gathering were women. And I asked Jesus about that one time, I said, no, it's kind of interesting, I'm doing these enlightenment gatherings and there's almost all women at them. He said, well, it's not really a male-female thing, it's, it's this macho, uh, macho man kind of like quiet, strong, more like the, here, the John Wayne, you know, don't, John Wayne wasn't showing his emotions, very rarely, <laughs> out here in the Wild West, he was like really holding those emotions down. And so I think that it can seem to be tough love, but when we start doing our no private thoughts, no people pleasing, and people come here, and they start to give themselves permission to let it up, oh, a lot comes up, and it's not pretty. Uh, the unconscious mind, the shadow is not pretty when it comes up. 
So I think the most important thing is is to have that invitation and there's many movies that have been made where um, there's the Holy Spirit has to teach through contrast. When there's so much pride, there's so much arrogance, when the mind is so closed and shut down, I would say, I call it the school of hard knocks. Uh, the harder the nut is to crack and the deeper the pride is, the Spirit will bring in whatever it takes to crack that nut. Because it's God's will for perfect happiness and that nut, that denial and that repression is blocking out the light. So we have movies such as The Peaceful Warrior with Dan Millman. Uh, I've had people watch that and they go, that's, that's an extreme movie. I mean that definitely flushes, Socrates flushes uh, the ego right out of its nesting place. You know, there's that scene on the ledge where, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the ego is coming out full. It's not like hiding back in the nest. All the bees are out of the nest, and the queen <laughs> is out of the nest. You know, it's it's showing everything it's got, and it's vicious. And Socrates, you know, it, even with integrity, like you were talking about, the basic respect and integrity. When he, when Dan says he'll meet him on the bridge. And he shows up with a bunch of excuses. This is the first time he's going to even meet him. He doesn't even have the respect to be honest. He just has a bunch of excuses. Uh, basically, uh, Socrates pushes him in the river. And people will <laughs> say, you know, well, I don't know about spiritual teachers that push, <laughs> push people in the river. But you can see it was actually quite a, a helpful teaching device. Because that started to crack that nut right away. And then it just got more intense and more intense until the ego reared up again like, oh no, no, old man, I'm not doing it your way. And then the motorcycle accident. Whenever guilt and, and fear is held in the mind, it just, if, if you don't let it up and you don't let it out into the light for healing, then it, the ego just takes it out onto the body. And then we see Dan's body just mangled uh, a gymnast with a mangled body because of the pride. It, it just, I, I thought that movie was a very good movie, but it was showing the extremes. Interesting that Dan was calling for spiritual awakening. There's that little willingness that was there, and that's why Socrates appeared at that gas station. And, and yet, the pride was so strong that I would say that movie would go into my genre of spiritual tough love uh, movies. Strong, strong teachings, because he had the willingness, because he was wanting it, and it opened up. Now there have been a lot of great mystics and saints all over the world for many centuries. Uh, I met a woman over in Holland recently, and she said, I've read so many teachings, I've listened to so many gurus, and this and this, but she said, I just am down and out. She said, I'm down to three. Jesus, Mary Baker Eddy, and you. Uh, she says, even with a lot of the Eastern teachings and the gurus, I'll, I can only go so far. And then there's still something that, that I hit a wall with. But she said, wow, with, with, it's just like it's bottomless. It's infinite with these teachings. And, and of course, Jesus mentioned in the Course that they mentioned about Jesus that he was the first to awaken from the dream, which would kind of imply that Buddha wasn't awake. But Jesus, the teachings are so joyful, so friendly, so respectful, that most people who work with the Course get that feeling when they pick the book up, like, whoa, this is not a human author. And I think everyone who does work with the Course, and I, as well as Mary Baker Eddy, uh, they're, the teachings are so penetrating that the ego reactions and resistances are so strong. It's like, you're not getting diluted teachings here. You know, it's not, you're not getting teachings that are with ice. You're getting it straight. No ice. Just gold. <laughs> like a straight whiskey, just straight. Or vodka. <laughs> we had a great, or Mel and I had a great, great time down there in, in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and I think from the back of the room, Lewis looked and pointed at Armel and went, You're like vodka! <laughs> and she, vodka! <laughs> it's straight, you know, it's straight. So, another one, with Mary Baker Eddy, uh, I, was, I was really blessed. 
um, to get this set of books uh, at my little peace house. And it was called, it was a series of little books called We Knew Mary Baker Eddy. And this was her staff. These are the people that lived in the same house with her. Tough love. Tough love. They would say she could be as sweet and kind and gentle as anyone on the planet. But if you were with her for a while and you knew better, the certain ego thing, she was as sharp as a general. She could carve, carve, carve. And so that was tough love. And, and that, I think that's kind of a rare glimpse, that, that series, We Knew Bear, Mary Baker Eddy, because she was, you know, absolutely, like Jesus is in the Course, absolutely, positively non-compromising. How do you compromise with truth and expect to be happy? How do you compromise with truth and expect to transcend sickness and death? You have to be absolutely uncompromising in your practice of this. You can't give the ego a little leeway, oh, here's a little rope, you know, just a little, I'll give you a little rope. You can't compromise with the ego and expect to be happy. You can't compromise with the ego and expect to know eternal life. You know, it's just going to be another form of compromise. And compromise, generally, in this world, has a pretty good connotation. Uh, when they talk about collective bargaining agreements, compromise is the positive thing. And then Jesus comes along in the Course, and he's got a beautiful line in his text, Salvation is no compromise of any kind. Salvation is no compromise. He's putting compromise in the ego category. He's saying you will never know who you are, you'll never know God, you will never know peace of mind with compromise. That every day, in what seems to be the human life, there's a hundred or a thousand little compromises that are made every day. And he even took the time, and I believe it was in Absence from Felicity, he took a day with Helen Schuckman, where he started out with her in the morning, and he started off with, I love you. And Jesus starts off with, I love you, then he's like, and? <laughs> and and I'm going to point out to you today, every point where you, where you could have made a better, more loving choice. <laughs> Imagine Jesus Christ working with you and going through a whole day, where she could have offered a cab ride to a friend, and so on and so forth. So could compromise go in the category of people pleasing? Yes, that's exactly it. Where I don't think Jesus actually uses the term people pleasing, but that's why that's one of our guidelines is because compromise is so insidious, it's so ingrained in what seems to be the human life that you could be like uh, Paul Simon's song, "Believe you're gliding down the highway when in fact you're slip sliding away." You know, it can be that subtle and that slippery. So. So I would say that's why that no people pleasing has been so effective with our communities is because we would rather people let it up and out than to try to put on a happy face or try to behave in a peaceful loving way while not feeling peaceful and loving. You know, we, we would rather it come all the way up and out and, and be part of a purge and a healing. And so it does you know, rock the boat. I mean, part of people-pleasing is put in place by the ego because it wants to minimize fear without letting it go. The last part is important to hear. Minimize fear without letting it go. That's why the people-pleasing, all these little bargains, all these little, oh, let me please you, and you, you start to realize, wow, I'm never going to find stability in my mind if I'm so external-oriented to pleasing others. It's almost the op opposite of egocentric pride, of personal pride, now making other people so important that you want to please their feelings, please their whims, please their preferences, and you lose all sense of integrity by trying to please everyone, instead of listening to the Holy Spirit, which is, what would you have me do? I think too, what's helpful is when you start to bring everything back to just the core ideas too, is that, for example, let's look a little bit about gift giving, whether it's Christmas or birthdays, general 
things, Valentine's Day, and so on and so forth. God just gives. I mean, God, God doesn't know what reciprocity is. God's, God's not waiting for something back. Even though sometimes maybe in the Old Testament or certain scriptures, you know, they'll, they'll kind of paint like an anthropomorphic picture of God. They'll put human characteristics to God. As if God gets angry. God's like, oh, come on. I've been patient with you, but now that's enough. I'm going to zap this tribe. And this. <laughs> it's almost like God is human. Like, that's enough. You crossed the line. I'm zapping you. I'm zapping the whole tribe. You just had enough. <laughs> And then we have things in the Bible about fear God and keep His commandments, and, and that gets interpreted as literally, you're supposed to fear God, you're supposed to tremble in the presence of God. It makes no sense at all. If God is pure love, why should we be trembling <laughs> in the presence of God's love? We should be in a state of rever reverence, uh, awe, just absolute awe. So, what I think is, is interesting is, is I would say this young man is also purely positively, if you see that you can only heal him by perceiving the sanity in him. Yeah. I would say that he's helping to actually unearth some beliefs in reciprocity, in the sense that there's so much expectation in the human condition. Like if I, if I get you a birthday present every year, then when my birthday rolls around, it's like, and, or a Christmas, you know, that was the thing when we were kids, we were growing up, you know, we were watching like a hawk eye, what our siblings got, or we were talking to our neighbors, what did you get, and this and that, and, and, and if there were no presents under there, you know, and our parents tried to say, well, Rudolph had a cold this year, and, you know, whatever, we were, we were mad at Rudolph, or Santa Claus, or something, and if we, we didn't believe in, in uh, Santa Claus that we were mad at our parents, because there's so much of this getting mechanism that's at the core of the ego belief system, and we're having to learn to give, give, give as God gives, give unconditionally. And Jesus even talks about it in the Course, he says, who gives a gift and then waits to see if the gift is even received? much less reciprocated. He's not, leave the reciprocated off, he's, he's not even going there. That's just purely ego. But who gives a gift and waits to see if the gift is received? In other words, he'll come out and say, then if that's the case, if you're paying attention to whether the gift was even received or not, then you need healing, you need help. You don't know what true giving is. He talks about that with healing too. He has a part in the manual for teachers, should healing be repeated? And if you doubt a healing, if you if you're pray, you offer it up for healing to the light, and then your eyes are like hawk eyes waiting to look at the body for the symptoms. Are the symptoms going away? Ah. Is it working yet? Is it working yet? <laughs> Jesus says, if you doubt a healing, then you need to go right back to the Holy Spirit and ask for healing. That you haven't healed at all, as long as you're still looking out on the bodies and judging whether the healing occurred based on the symptoms. You're still using the body, you're using the, what the ego made as your witness to whether the healing has worked or not. That can't work, it, it just can't work. And so, if you go much deeper into that, you start to see that you need a healing of perception, that fragmented perception is the, is the, is the sickness. It's not the body, the body's the body's not even sick. Jesus tells us in the Course, don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal the perception of the body. Because it's the perception, like in the movie last night, it's the perception and the interpretations where the distortion occurs, not in the form. The form is just a projection of what's going on in the mind. So, I had those kind of experiences where I started to live very simply, and I went through all kinds of phases where I was just learning to live in divine providence and float around, and my divine providence experience, they got me into Jesus being my guide and my so-called boss, and me not having earthly bosses, trusting that like the birds were provided for, I would be provided for, and I just didn't have a lot of money to be doling out money for presents to 
niece, nephews, and so on and so forth, like I had done for many years. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, this isn't going to be pretty. When you give gifts for a number of years, there's like almost like an expectation that gets built up. And then when you, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm just living a simple life and following God now, to a little <laughs> child. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Tough, like what? So I do remember the first time I went to a birthday party, and, and when I showed up, and uh, when I didn't have a gift, uh, I wasn't giving gifts to anyone uh, at that point. In fact, I was actually reading that part in the course, uh, I think it's number seven in the Ten Characteristics of a Teacher of God, it's called Generosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was talking in that thing about the teacher of God does not want anything that he cannot give away. What would he want it for, he could only lose because of it. He was equating true generosity with an attitude, like the Beatitudes. It had nothing to do with mm -hmm. like philanthropy, like Carnegie or Bill Gates or you know, money, 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 presence, presence, presence. It was almost like he was implying, you know, you've got a sick interpretation of gifts giving and you need to come back to the generosity of your heart, the simple joy. Your peace of mind is a huge gift. It's no small gift at all. You can offer that freely to everyone. So I went through many of these things, but one time with my niece, it was so good, because I was so much in the Holy Spirit, and I was at the birthday party or whatever, and then my little niece, she came to me, Uncle David, didn't you get me a present with a little quivering lip? <laughs> okay, here we go, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came through with such, I just come here, and a big hug, and it, something came through about us being together, or me playing with you, or sharing all this. It, the Spirit didn't leave it at nothing, it just with a blank space. The Spirit gave what was being extended, and, and she went, oh. And then every time I would go to a birthday party or whatever, they would be even happier to see me, with no gift, but, but to be there with them at their party, the presence, to hold them, to play with them, to offer the time. The Spirit was guiding me to go to the party. Not always go to course groups or course conventions or whatever. Go be with them, swing them around, go play with them in the yard, you know. That was part of the generosity of the Spirit, and they quickly got a hold of that was what they really wanted, more than some tinker toys that would just get thrown away, you know, in so many weeks or months. Yeah, when you give a physical possession, you divide its ownership. Like if I had a million dollars and I gave you half of it, I'd have less and, you know, there'd be half and half. And what we know from miracles is when we give miracles away, it increases the love in the giver and the receiver. Now that's the kind of generosity we want to get into. Increases the love in the giver and the receiver. Not lessens, not a sense of dividing and lessening. Mm. It's like we, we've been in the habit of trying to take things in and stuff things down. Because we thought that was the way to be a kind, yes. functioning person. And we, yes. we don't realize how much that, that stuffing and that repression hurts us. No. People will sometimes say, like sickness, uh, like cancer, psychosomatic, the, the psycho, it, it, is, it does come down to our mind. And when we have attack thoughts, unless we let them up, and we let them up to the light, and we allow ourselves to even, at times, talk about them or even express them, and we try to pretend that, that they're not there, but still believe in them and push them down, then we don't heal. And I think you'll find in in our community, which we've got communities around different places in the world and people practicing this, no private thoughts and no people pleasing, it takes a little while to kind of get into the rhythm of it because it's almost like, you know, going against the current. You've, you've been kind of covering and pushing stuff away for so long, trying to be nice and good, and then, you know, you want to get in touch with it, but it seems like there's a risk involved, like, oh, I'm... I don't know how this is going to go over. We always talk about discernment too, like if you have one good trusted friend that loves you and that can hear you, that's where the Spirit will guide you to begin. And then it will grow in your, your circles. Mm -hmm. I had an email this morning 
from a friend, and I love it that people can just pour their hearts out about anything and pour their thoughts out, and I think it's quite healing because that's why people write and have been writing emails to me for the last 20 years is because it's a catharsis. Even if they feel like they don't have anybody in their life that they can let this up with, they feel safe with me and therefore they go right into it. And, and I think uh, I have a whole book called Healing in Mind, it's just uh, emails to me and my loving responses back, and sometimes they'll say at the end of a long expression session email, oh, I think I'm answering my own questions, you don't have to respond to this email. They, it was just the allowance to write the email and to put it all out, that was the healing. And then they started getting the answers. They don't need somebody to tell them the answers. They know their answers, but they're covered over. So I'm just going to read it to you so you can get a sense of it, because this is what I welcome from everyone. Hi, long time no emails. This email has been in my mind for a long time, but I didn't know what to write it or not. It's been quite a tough summer for me. Ego don't let, let me go easily. So much stuff coming up at the same time. I have a huge negativity going on. Mm -hmm. Kids showing to me that my attitude, oh boy, not good. I'm doing the lessons, I try, I pray, so on, nothing happens, everything feels very heavy. I know stuff intellectually, not in my heart, and as long as it's like that, it's nothing. Nothing really sinks in in my heart, maybe for seconds. I see, I try, I try, lose patience, I feel like I'm never going to make it. Who is making what? Yep, ego, ego. I even started to hate you, and a lot. I felt, it felt very strange because you haven't done anything bad to me, only been very nice. So twisted, exclamation, exclamation. My very old belief came up too. I can be happy only two weeks and then something bad will happen. I totally forgot that. My daughter has been really angry. I can see my anger played out in her and I want it to end. My prayers don't seem to work at all. I'm miserable right now. I saw about your silent retreat coming up in January. That made me angry too. <laughs> Why so expensive? Two weeks. How to get money? I even envy my friend. She has money to go everywhere she wants. She doesn't have to work. She doesn't have kids. She has a husband who studies the course. I told her that also. She was able to hear it. I know her life hasn't been easy. I'm feeling so rotten. Bad, evil person, I'm worthless, my life sucks, nothing works for me, I'm always depressed, time, it's, time to time is better, then it f fails again, I don't have any strength left, I don't know what to do, I feel like smashing this computer, too much everything, I should know better, I shouldn't feel like this, guilty, feeling so stupid, I'm studying the course for a long time and don't get anything, but I look back at my life before it was much worse, things got also better. It feels so twisted, like the ego is getting nastier and nastier, won't ever let go of me. Laughing, you're never going to make it. I really want peace of mind, four exclamation points. Now I offer this email to the Holy Spirit's hand, I don't need this shit anymore, I'm tired, help me, and thank you. And that's where it starts, you know, we, we don't have to pretend, we don't have to keep playing the games of should be, shoulda, coulda, would have. Uh, should be different than it is and everything, that's the first step, is, is not holding it in anymore. And letting the Spirit guide you to people and places that can, are there to listen, but also there to be demonstrations and openings of, of non-judgment. Because we need, just like in this world, we need way showers, we need mentors, we need role models, it's the same way that Jesus works, where he, he's using the symbols of the world to slowly bring us, like, oh, there's another way, oh yeah, there's another way, oh thank you for reminding me there's another way. Uh, just someone to call, someone to reach out to, that's why we have had these gatherings over these recent years too, is because it's, there's a spaciousness here in the canyon, and, and for people to come and just relax and begin to trust that that the other way will, will make itself obvious. So thank you. Thank you both for 
for sharing that because mm -hmm. that's how we we heal when we just hold it in our mind it just bounces around like a pinball and if we just get crazier and crazier and when we open it up we can feel the relief coming already like I don't have to try to deal with this all by myself alone there's there's help on the way thank you for unwind your mind I've enjoyed it greatly thank, thank you huge thank you the, the world the entire world the entire cosmos we perceive as is our thoughts we could say a reflection as if there's something out there and there's a mind that's in there and the thoughts are being reflected out there but it's not really it's not really an out there and an in there it's it's we can talk about spirituality peace of mind waking up god but what it comes down to is i say 99 percent practice and so when you're describing these kind of extreme situations i think if we went around the love's nest here there's a number of people that could talk about in their own lives the extreme situations i know for me even teaching the course publicly um, back in the early years there was actually another course teacher that was throwing out big threats and putting bizarre YouTubes, you know, twisted popsicle um, character YouTubes out. Uh, really some pretty strange stuff, but again, you have to stick to the, the teachings. You know, Jesus said in the, in the Bible, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. He goes even further in A Course in Miracles to say that the meek shall inherit the earth means they shall literally overcome it with their strength. Because, you know, Jesus was always equating meekness with strength. To the ego, that's the opposite. Weapons, defense, attack, that's strength. You know, who's got the biggest military, rules the world, you know. The only way you stop a, a dictator and a tyrant was with a, with a good military blast and you blast them away. Jesus' teachings are so the opposite of absolutely everything that planet Earth has to offer. I know from my own experiences that uh, I've had experiences where I, I visited a friend who I was just going to her house to meditate with her um, and, and watch some metaphysical movies, but she didn't tell me that she had an uh, uh, insanely jealous uh, ex-husband that had, had been divorced for a couple, two or three years. and. They had some scenes where I'd be there meditating with her, and it was like a Jack Nicholson movie. Uh, red rum, red rum. I mean, the look in the, in the window, the blood coming in the door, the face with the raging anger and everything, is I'm just on the calmly on the floor watching a metaphysical movie with my arm out just watching this. But I had gotten so much into the teachings of Jesus around if I defend myself, I'm attacked. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. Someone smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Where are you going to find teachings like that? These completely overturn every thought of this world. In fact, to the world, these seem like ridiculous teachings. You know, they, they make Jesus look ridiculous, as if like he's the most impractical teacher in the history of the world. To come out with sayings like that. But in my own journey, being raised Christian, going through Bible school in summer, having my own issues with Christianity and sacrifice and penance and punishment and all this and this, working through all that, and then from years, decades of working with the Course, that when I would get uh, email threats, voicemail threats, uh, or Physically, uh, at one point, this this uh, insanely jealous ex-husband, I was out walking to a pine forest one morning uh, to go meditate, and his car drove up, and he was he was listening to this Christian um, radio station radio show called Focus on the Family, Dr. James Dobson, <laughs> and I'm just staying with her and meditating, and I'm walking along there, and, and through his perception, he was perceiving me as the enemy as the one breaking up the family, even though they've been divorced for some years and everything. So I was the, the villain, the devil, Satan himself, taking a walk. 
And I could hear Jesus saying, stay with me, stay. I'm just out on a sunny day walking along the side of a golf course, stay with me, stay with me. Guy got out of his car, literally this body got thrown to the ground. You know, people talk about fear of, of violence or this and this. It was like the whole thing got used to the point where um, he ended up having such, it was such a contradiction in his mind to be a Christian, listening to a Christian show and throwing somebody to the ground. It's just like, it, it took that to pop. <laughs> you know, the, the full intensity, it, it hit him at some point, and his face changed. And then he picked me up like he was Mother Teresa. <laughs> no, he turned from, from the villain to Mother Teresa, because he popped through it and then went back, and, and it, was, it turned into a, a tremendously healing thing. Even what would seem to be physical violence, he, it turned into a huge healing, where he cried and he said, I've all this hurt and I'd never t talked about it, and he just cracked wide open. And then when she came back later in the day, she said, how was your morning? I said, lots of healing. <laughs> he had been gone by then. But we have to follow the teachings. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. The best defense is actually no defense. And I've had that happen when I've been out and about around the world like a, a growling, angry dog charging me, and then I'll just be in presence. Sometimes, one time I was just, I kneeled down and put my arms out, and it, it's like the dog hit a, hit a glass window. Because I was so defenseless, almost like the horse whisperer, that there was, there was no way that that dog was going to attack. I, I had no attack in my mind at all, just welcome. And you see the power of that, that that's why we watched that movie, the power of the mind, the power of thoughts, and also the power that we can change our thinking, we can align with that glory, with that love, with that light, with that presence. If this scenario, like with your, your ex-wife and your, your daughter, if this, if this was like their opportunity, their grand opportunity to live a glorious life, and open to eternal life, this is it. You know, the way that we handle these things, when the world comes in and, and says, you know, go after them, or attack, or defend, or so on and so forth, everyone's going to have to do what they feel comfortable with. So sometimes people do feel comfortable with hiring a lawyer. Uh, there, some people do receive steps, even around all kinds of practical things, um, sometimes people do feel to move. You know, that, that it, the guidance can be what the guidance is going to be. But I find if we just open up and we keep opening to that love in our heart, and we follow and take the steps, whatever those steps are given, then it just dissipates and goes away. And I've had that experience in my own life. Uh, one time, there was these uh, emails that were coming, and letters that were coming, with all these threats and everything. And I remember I was talking to my biological father at the time, uh, and he was saying, even though he was a Christian, he was raised Christian, he had raised me as a Christian, he was basically saying, you have to defend yourself against these threats. And he kept saying, you have to defend yourself. And I said, you know, if I would defend myself, I would be going against everything that Jesus ever taught me from a little boy on up to, to an adult. Because I said, what good is the value of the teachings if we don't live them, if we don't practice them? You know, what, what point? What's the value? And I would just answer a, a, a letter as I was guided, and be sending love, and, and so on and so forth, and, and it just went away, you know, it's just, that's how it works, you know, I can't tell you how many times that has happened over and over, and that was just me practicing the teachings. So I think you've done the right thing, and I think even with your daughter coming to you and speaking to you, that was, again, just an opportunity to say, am I going to really trust here that this works for everyone? Uh, just as much as me, me works for everyone, it's, it's 
the rule of it's the law of love, the law of forgiveness. When you stay by it, you come soaring from it in higher and higher states of mind, and that's what our our goal is. So I think it's good that you've stayed the course with that, and you've stayed in that place of meekness. You still can take actions. Um, there can be things that you can do, like one time when um, I was with a friend in Florida, and we went for a walk on the beach, and we came back, and the, the car was gone, <laughs> the our tents were gone, our clothes, money. This was one of my early Course in Miracles trips. Um, it was all gone, and my friend just looked at me, and she just said, now what? And I said, you know, it's just going to work together for the good, and, and I shared a few ideas that were on my heart, and it just came, everything came out of that miraculously. Uh, even being out of state, with the car gone, everything seemingly taken, um, it just opened the gateway for all these miracles to happen, just amazingly being taken care of. And then going up the other coast of Florida, sharing all the miracles at different churches, and having people say, thank you for sharing that, oh my God, that's exactly what I needed to hear. And I said, if, if, if Jesus had come to me before, or come to us before, and said, I'm going to take your car for a couple days, and uh, <laughs> don't worry, I'll take care, you're really good, and this is going to be a, an enjoyable experience for you. Uh, it would, what would I have said? We would have said, sure, you know, take the car, <laughs> you know. And that's pretty much the attitude that we had. We, we didn't have a reaction as if we were, we were robbed or stolen from or whatever. We, we were so open-eyed and so full of miracles, and so loved and so cared for, that it just strengthened our resolution to be miracle workers. We came out of it even stronger in our devotion and dedication to be miracle workers, and, and even more witnessing came from it. So it almost sounds a little bit like the Bhagavad Gita and Arjuna and yeah. going out and right. be the best warrior you can be and so right. forth. Well, you know, it's the central teaching of the Course is one part where Jesus says, the one thing you can ask about anything safely is, what is it for? So, you know, I've traveled around the world and and the deeper I went into giving myself over to fully to this state of mind, I could start to feel like Shakespeare, all, all the world's a stage, you know, it, it really felt like a movie, more and more like a movie. And I watch all kinds of movies. I mean, I remember years ago watching some movies where the language in the movie, uh, I was just practicing my mind watching, but uh, my mother was in the other room doing the dishes, and I could hear the dishes clanking louder and louder, and then finally she said, do you have to watch a movie with such language? And already I was just using everything for training, I, you know, I, it's, it's my interpretation I was working on, getting purified. Or people would say, that's a very violent movie. I would, I would say, well, judgment in the mind is where the violence is, there aren't violent movies. And it would apply to this world as well. Um, I remember just being so swept up by Jesus, and I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, and, you know, I remember going down to Colombia, and Colombia is known for having the, these like, gorillas that live in the mountains that come down, kidnap people, you know, and it didn't go into Argentina with bars, of steel bars on the windows, and a lot of these countries. But um, when I landed down in Cali, Colombia, they, they said, oh, we've got a beautiful man and his wife and his children. We're going to stay with them, and it's out in the rural areas. So we went out there, but there were just guns everywhere. Not pistols, like rifles and guns absolutely everywhere. And even to go to the house where I was staying, we, we had to pass many, many gunmen. But I'm just in this, such a state of love and service and devotion that it, it all seems like fiction to me. I mean, I don't have reactions when I watch and see guns all over in movies, and I don't have, even when it's this character moving through time and space, it's the same thing. I'm waving to him. I, I wave with gunmen and guards and... You know, we have, it's a holy encounters, you know, those are like props, they have rifles over their shoulder, 
not rifles to go hunt big game or something. They're they're there for for people, <laughs> to shoot people. But I just think they're adorable, actually. And and I was on Facebook about a week ago, and I think I must have been tearing, telling one of those parables, and somebody took a quote from me, and I thought. They had my name, and this was the quote, and I thought, this must have been from one of my parables, but they actually put it on Facebook. Guns are fun, because, or guns are fun when they're fiction. That was, you saw that one? I'm like, see, I don't know, they pull all my quotes, I think, I'm like, who, who, who wrote that one? Guns are fun. Oh, me! <laughs> right. Guns are fun when they're fiction, and, and it must have been from one of my parables where I'm, down and having so much fun with waving at the gunman and this and this, or I go to the changing of the guard or different places. And uh, I, I think I was in Argentina one time, and I was, I think I went, was walking by a bank, and they had armed gunmen at the bank, and it was a changing of ships. And you know, some of these countries in Belgium, France, and Argentina, they kiss so much. It was these two armed, you know, <laughs> kissing. <laughs> I was, like, where's my camera here? You know, it's, because it's just, we don't see some of these images, you know, the kissing gunman, you know, it's like, you don't see that, we see John Wayne, you know, and killing people, isn't it? But it's, it's so beautiful because you start to realize that what is it for? That's really for our mind, to see the world completely differently. And everything is neutral. Uh, you know, in other words, the Holy Spirit knows that everything is equal, they're just symbols. So, for example, could the Holy Spirit ever use guns? Has anybody ever seen the movie Revolver? Mm. Well, the Holy Spirit uses guns a lot. It's, it's almost like a, a gangster wake-up movie. And it just shows that the Holy Spirit can use guns just as easily as flower petals. Um, they're just as benign, they're just symbols. The problem, like we found last night with the movie, is when you start to follow the interpretations in your mind, you react to those, and even the main characters in there, you know, there was a lot of threats flying here and there from all of the characters, and then they'd go to the next scene and they found out they were completely mistaken, and then they had a new set of threats and, and fears, and then they were completely mistaken, and I loved how we went through so many of those things, it was kind of a rinsing, like, you don't know what the hell's going on here. And that's beautiful because that opened them up to faith and guidance and being shown something greater and collaboration. So, yeah, I, I would say uh, that the United States seems to be a country where there seems to be a lot in terms of, of gun ownership. And yet my teachings question the very concept of ownership of anything. Owning a car, a house, an orange, an apple, uh, owning a body, you know, it, it goes so deep, dislodging the mind from, from the idea of even ownership. You know, there's no ownership in heaven, why should we pretend and believe in these concepts where we end up defending what we believe we own? Even guns, you know, guns is more of an extreme example. I did a talk, I think in Barcelona, not too long ago, where I was in the backyard in a garden, and um, I think I started talking about food, and sex, and money. And, and it was great, because I started off there, and then I started getting at the judgments and the preferences that are underneath it, and the self-concept that was made to take the place of God, and, and that we finally got down to starting to see that that the call for love that was underneath that. It was like, oh, it's calling for love. When I'm craving this, when I'm craving that, I'm really calling for God, calling for God, calling for God. And, and just like if you had a little toddler who fell down, you wouldn't scold or smack the, the toddler for falling down. You go and pick them up and say, oh, here, I'll hold your hand, try again, you know. We need to be that loving with our mind. Because our mind's been caught in this twisted guilt thing, and it needs relief. And we need to, to answer that call, and, and do that consistently. And then, 
I would say the farther reaches of that is, is you have so much joy to extend, and when you know you're, you're extending God's joy and God's purpose, you know, like the Bible said, if God is with us, who can be against us? I guess that's how I feel. I, I didn't blink when I was invited to Venezuela years ago. Um, this was back at a time when uh, there was so much seeming friction with the United States that they were running, they were doing war games. They were preparing for an attack from the United States on their oil fields as I'm going into Venezuela. So there's, United, there's war games for preparation from an invasion from the United States going on. I'm just there as a miracle worker. I'm going, meeting all these open-hearted people. We're laughing, we're crying, we're having huge revivals and healing gatherings. I'm just being whisked around. I was on like eight um, television and radio shows. Um, I had corporate sponsorship for my trip, Ooh. sponsored by Coke and Toyota, uh, a mystic. Talking about that the world's not real, uh, being sponsored by Toyota and Coke. I mean, this when you're serving spirit, God's like, I will blow you away. I will blow the fear away. I will show you the glory. I will take your mind and lift you up so high that you will forget that you ever had a fear. And I was so willing to do that. Whereas I know some other people were like seeing, well, I'm not going to Venezuela now because of who's in charge and what's happening there and this and this. Hugo Chavez. Yeah, Hugo Chavez. Did, didn't cross my mind, you know. I'm, I'm right in there. And I see everyone that way, so I, I would greet Hugo Chavez the way I would greet everyone else there. Uh, and, and Hugo was actually pretty big into Jesus as well as a lot of other just strange mixes in the world. but. We probably would have had a nice talk about Jesus, actually. Oh, you, you met him? I didn't, oh, okay. but when I was down there, but we, we could have. Yeah. When, like when Osama bin Laden, when they were trying to find him, somebody joked one time that, where's the last place that he would hide where he wouldn't be found? And they said, just outside the Bush Ranch in, in <laughs> Texas. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I, if, I, well if I met Osama, I'd have, I actually would have a pretty good lunch with him. I mean, I, I have wonderful lunches with everyone. And I mean, it doesn't really matter. I, was, I came to Cincinnati one time where I have this peace house, and um, I was in there meditating, praying one time, and there was a knock on the door, and I went to the door, and there was a gentleman there, and I said, hey, come on in. I invited him in, I fixed him a cup of tea, offered him some food and everything, and he was... I didn't, I don't know these things, but later on I found out that he was a wanted uh, criminal, uh, that there was a, a manhunt uh, going on for him, there was a warrant out for his arrest and everything, and his, it was all from his ex-wife, where they had gotten into such an, a, a conflict that there were, she had, he had left and that she'd put warrants out for arrest, and if they would even come near each other, the police would be called in, and so on and so forth. I don't know any of this. I, I had the most wonderful time. And then, after he left, and I described it to another friend, they said, do you know who that was? They were like trying to tell me that this is like a wanted criminal. And I was like, oh, come on. You know, I, I'm not going to buy all that stuff. And I had such a really a cordial, wonderful time with him. Eventually, weeks later, his wife called and said, David, I need your help. I've gotten so into the ego and so fear that I've got so many warrants for his arrest out, and I need to forgive. And we need to meet and talk, but now we can't get near each other, because I've called in so many authorities and, and took, you know, all this restraining, uh, orders. restraining orders and advice that she said, I, we can't even get within 20 feet of each other. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, if he calls, you know, could you just arrange something, could you have us just pick a restaurant and we'll meet, and that's exactly what I did. He, he called in, I, I picked a restaurant, they met, and, and all this healing started. It reversed all this restraining orders and this negativity. But you have to see that it starts with yourself. If somebody's telling you somebody's a criminal, or they're this way or that way, 
you know, who needs to know that stuff? That's not helpful information for me at all. That's, that's not good background information. I, I'm t here to see the Christ in everyone. And, and I see the reflections of my mind. I mean, I see miracles, millions of miracles all over the world, because that's what I'm calling forth. Lots and lots of reflections of love and everything. And so, the, I, I mean, I had my days where I had my seeming test and my calls for faith, but then when that faith grows strong, you do see a different world. You don't see the same world that you saw through the ego's filter. Like if you had a window that you were looking at, it was all dusty and dirty, and you got hoses and soap and Windex out, and you made that crystal clear, you would definitely see a different world out of that car, than out of that dusty, muddy, filthy window, you know. When the filters clean, it's just completely different. You do have to put the actual quote in, when a brother behaves insanely, you can heal him only by perceiving the sanity in him. That's the actual quote. There's another quote that says, if, if a brother asks you, gives you an outrageous request, do it, as long as he doesn't bring harm to yourself or another. It's like every step in the awakening, as you go along, you just give it over to the Spirit and you let it be used for the, for the purpose of teaching through the attitude of love. And I'd say as you go along, the the egoic needs for things start to diminish as you pull your mind away from the ego belief system and it starts to feel more like a movie and more surreal, then the needs start to evaporate. And that's even in the Bible, you know, when Jesus would be out teaching, teaching, the apostles would come to him sometimes about, you know, Lord, you have to stop, you haven't eaten, and so on and so forth. He would say, I have manna from heaven. He was actually, like in the East, they kind of call it prana uh, energy. When the mind becomes more and more aligned with spirit, and, and less and less identified with the body, the egoic needs shrink and shrivel up and disappear. And then uh, you really feel like it's all just props. So, it's more like a lunch or a dinner becomes a backdrop. It's interesting you would ask that question right when they ring the bell <laughs> for lunch. <laughs> the practicalities, I love the cosmic humor. But that's, it becomes a backdrop just for heart-to-heart -heart sharing. And one time I was down in Plano, Texas, and um, I, was, I was an Indian man named um, Kumar uh, Arvind. And uh, he, oh, they was potlucks every day. I mean, they would bring in like three, four, five, six cakes and brownies and oh, just huge potlucks because we had a big, they had a big house, big gatherings. And, and at one point, he was despairing right before uh, lunchtime. It was his last question, my period right before lunch. And David, 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 every time we eat a morsel of food, every time we put food in our mouth, we are reinforcing the separation. Oh, so depressing. Everything we put in our mouth, reinforcing the separation, reinforcing the separation. What do we do? What do we do? And I said, Arvin, why do you eat? Oh, why do I eat? Why do I eat? What? Okay, I eat because I am hungry. I said, that is not a good enough reason. Okay then, David, please tell me what is a good reason. I said, we will eat for joy. So he turns to these 50 some people in his house, big buffet, they, okay everyone, today we will eat for joy. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, the, what's the purpose for anything? We have to apply the purpose to absolutely everything to get swept up into what it's all really for. And it was a very happy, lively lunch, because Arvin was leading the way. We will eat for joy! You see the difference between, we will eat for joy. It's so depressing, we reinforce the separation every time, you know, you can see the contrast there. And that's what it's about, it's about inspiration, it's about happiness, it's about joy. When you go to your mother's birthday party, and you meet all these people, it's for joy. You know, are we going to wait till it's a funeral? 
and everyone shows up then, or are we going to do it while we have the opportunity? You feel the guidance, you feel the inspiration, you're going. And, you know, that's, I think, we can, we can think that. Even in the Course of Miracles in the workbook, Jesus says, what's the purpose of a telephone? He, he says, on the level of this world, in form, the, the purpose of a telephone is to reach someone who is not in your proximity. He comes right out and says it. That everyone can relate to that definition, to reach, talk to somebody, communicate with somebody that's not in your proximity. But Jesus then says, the real question you should ask yourself is, what do you want to reach him for? What is the purpose of the phone call? You see, he's lifting the purpose of a phone from a time-space definition, reaching someone in your proximity, to what he does with everything, with guns, with food, with birthday cakes, with absolutely everything, with the body. What do I want to reach him for? What is the purpose for my brother? What is the purpose for my sister? So, I took a snapshot this morning from lesson 135, the longest course workbook lesson that there is, out of 365. Because I thought that would be a good way to end the, the morning gathering. And and this paragraph is absolutely mind-blowing. This is, this is food for thought. <laughs> I'll take this one with you to lunch. It says, this is from Lesson 135, uh, paragraph 12, A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan, comma, although it cannot know the outcome which is best, the means by which it is achieved nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. I'll read it again. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan, although it cannot know the outcome which is best, the means through which it is achieved, nor how to recognize the problem that the plan is made to solve. Basically saying, you better be clueless and trusting if you're going to be happy. Because anything you have in your mind that you think you know about anything in this world, anything about any situation, person, place, thing, is going to harm your mind in the sense you won't have peace and awareness. It must misuse the body and its plans until it recognizes this is so. But when it has accepted this as true, then it is healed and lets the body go. So. We're talking really about guidance, and as you go, I think we've heard this morning that there's lots of different ways that guidance can come through. The Holy Spirit's guidance can only come through your filter with what you currently believe. It, the Holy Spirit's never going to give you guidance that's beyond your, your level of, of receptivity. What good would it do if He gave you an answer that you couldn't even receive or interpret? But always, the Holy Spirit will take you into deeper faith and trust of starting to realize lesson number one, nothing I see means anything. That you don't understand what this world is for. And that the only way out of a perceptual problem is, is trust and guidance to be unwound by the Holy Spirit. And so we're all into practicality. You know, that's why it's, it's just good to come and open your mind to, to pray and to, to listen. And it's wonderful that you're all here to talk about it so openly, because I think everyone today has really offered a, a great blessing. We've all been blessed by everything that's been shared here. So, have a wonderful lunch. <laughs> for joy, eat for joy. And I believe, do we have a, a comedy routine, perhaps tour? <laughs> At 2 o'clock, there's the bell. At 2 o'clock, Jason, where do you want people to? Gathering. At the gathering room. So it'll be like a comedy routine and possibly a, a little tour. Maybe a tour hat. Maybe a tour afterwards. He's got his tour hat on. His safari hat. Okay, thank you. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.